Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Decoding Cryptography, a lectured series where we take a detailed look at modern day encryption systems and how they work. In today's lecture video, we're going to talk about the advanced encryption standard. If you remember from last time, we discussed the data encryption standard, which was developed in the 70s and actually became the first standardized symmetric encryption algorithm in the United States. We also discussed a variant of the data encryption standard called triple des, which actually just uh, triples the length of the key by encoding and then decoding uh, in various steps. So for today, we're going to discuss the advanced encryption standard, which is not using a Feistel ladder structure like the data encryption standard, but a substitution permutation network. And we'll look at what that actually means. We're also going to look at the concepts of confusion and diffusion and show how the advanced encryption standard does these very well, which is why it's still used today. So let's begin. The advanced encryption standard was actually developed in the early 2000s after it was discovered that DES was not secure enough or strong enough to meet our modern day needs. And so the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, held a little competition to see which algorithm would replace DES. And the algorithm that won was known as the Rindale algorithm. In 2001, it was established as the advanced encryption standard. And so the Rindale algorithm works similarly to the DES algorithm in the sense that it uses a fixed key length and a fixed number of rounds in order to encrypt the data. And so for the lowest security setting, you have a key length of 128 bits that is used to encrypt data through 10 rounds. The next uh, security setting will be a key length of 192 bits, which will be used to encrypt 12 rounds. And then finally, you have a key length of 256 bits, which is used to encrypt 14 rounds. So the standard block size for the message is going to be 128 bits, but it's actually going to be uh, 16 bytes is how we're going to treat it because the operations in the advanced encryption standard are actually done on bytes, not bits, unlike DES. We'll see what this means right now. So the advanced encryption standard works in the following way. It treats the message as 16 bytes, here labeled from A through P, and operations on these bytes are going to be done over what's called a finite field or a Galois field. If you've never seen finite fields before, they might seem rather strange. Essentially what a finite field is, is a set of numbers that are finite, where if you do multiplication or addition, the resulting number will also be included in that set. And so a very common field that we can all think of as of, of is the uh, real number field. Anything on the real number field, if you do addition, multiplication, division, will also be contained in the real number field. But the real number field has an infinite number of elements. Whereas with a finite field such as integer mod 2 or mod any prime number, you will only get a finite number of elements. So in this case for integer mod 2, you get just 0 and 1. Now finite field operations don't always look very intuitive. For example, when you multiply in GF2 to the 8, what you actually get is essentially XORing bit by bit. And the reason I bring this up is just so we're familiar with the language of what does it mean to do operations and what mathematical field we're working with with AES. In practice, all we're looking at is XORing each bit in that byte block whenever we add a key. And this will become important. So the Rindale algorithm starts in the following way. First, you expand the key into n plus 1 round keys for however many rounds you want to do. In this case, if you wanted to do 10 rounds, you expand the key to 11 round keys. You start by XORing that extra round key that you have. Then, for each round, you're going to do the following. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to substitute those bytes, and you're going to use a substitution matrix to do that. So imagine we have the following message. That first byte in the message represented here in hexadecimal will no longer be OE after it goes through the S box. And this works for all the bytes in the message. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to rotate the rows of the message in a fixed way. That first row is not going to be rotated. However, the second row is going to be rotated 1 to the left. And then the third row will be rotated 2 to the left. And then finally, the fourth row will be rotated 3 to the left. 
And so the resulting message is going to look something like this. The third step in each round is going to be what's called mixing the columns. And so what mixing co the columns does is it actually just multiplies each column in that message by what's called a column mix columns table. And then the resulting product of that multiplication will become the new column. And so as you can see here, we have a mixed columns table with a fixed uh, values. And then you have say for instance the first row in this message OE 6A 9 9 and 5 3 represented here in hexadecimal and what we're gonna get is going to be another column because the mixed columns table is a 4 by 4 matrix multiplied by a 4 by 1 matrix or vector in this case which will equal a 4 by 1 if any of you have taken a linear algebra class this will look very familiar to you when you have an x by x matrix multiplied by an x by y matrix, the result will be an x by y matrix. And so what we get is the ciphertext, new, the new ciphertext column that will become column number one in our ciphertext. Finally, we're just going to add the round key for each round. And then we're going to repeat this for every single round, except for the final round where we will omit the mixed columns step. Interestingly enough, the reason we uh, do not do mixed columns in the final round is because we swap it with the add round key, so the add round key goes number three in that final round, and at that point, since mixed columns is deterministic, it doesn't actually add any security properties. The reason we do the swap is for the sake of efficiency, because we want the encryption and decryption algorithms to follow the same general trend of doing those four steps. So now let's talk about what makes AES secure. And the two things we want to talk about here are confusion and diffusion. So what is confusion? Well, essentially imagine you have a ciphertext and a plain text. The idea of confusion is that you want each bit in that ciphertext to depend on the key in several different parts. And so the way that we can do this is by providing a mixing of the key values using the add round key operation at each round. Now diffusion, on the other hand, is the idea that changing one bit in the plain text should change, on average, half the bits in the cipher text, and vice versa. The way we accomplish this is just by mixing up the position of that cipher text at each round using the rotate rows mix columns, and the sub-bytes operations. And so let's think about why these two concepts are so important. Well, confusion will obscure the relationship between the ciphertext and the key of the message, which is important because knowing those two will allow you to find the message, whereas diffusion will do the ciphertext and the plain text, which knowing those two will get you the key. And so this is why we want to do this is because it helps obscure those relationships which makes it harder for Eve to decrypt the final message. And so even though AES uses a relatively small key size in the grand scheme of things, it is really really good at securing messages. And in fact, the best known cryptanalytic technique can only beat brute force methods of decrypting an AES encrypted message in seven rounds. What this means is that nobody's created a cryptanalytic technique that can beat brute force methods for the 10, 12, or 14 round AES encryption algorithm, so it hasn't been cracked yet. In the next lesson, we're actually going to go over some of those cryptanalytic techniques and talk about two concepts of security known as CCA and CPA security. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, please share this video with anyone that you think might find it interesting, and share any feedback you have in the comments section. One final thing, uh, shout out to Emma out in Savannah who um, sent me a video recently of her resetting these lecture videos. You're an inspiration to us all that you're learning this stuff at such a young age. And I encourage you to continue on this path because it's a very fun and very interesting field to join. Anyway, that's it for now. Um, until next time, this is Decoding Cryptography.